There's a look at the weather around the country this Wednesday afternoon. It is cool in the eastern U.S., not counting the Gulf, where it's still quite warm. In the western U.S., though, a lot of heat. Let's break it down. The cool weather being caused by this 1020 millibar high up in Wisconsin. And we can see northerly flow and not just the cool 80 degree readings, but also dew points are rather dry. 50s across much of the Midwest and down south. Haven't quite cleared out the moisture. Dew point still up near 70, and that's helping to support this thunderstorm activity from northeast Texas to Georgia. Down south, there's that polar front. Temperature still around 100 from Lufkin back to Waco, but up to the north, 80s in the Texas Panhandle. And typically this time of year when we are in pure tropical air, they will see 95 to 100. So obviously quite a cool down. In the western U.S., monsoon conditions continuing, although most of that's relegated to the Kingman and Mogollon Rim area. Some storms through the Four Corners area in Colorado and Utah. In the northwestern U.S., still pretty warm, but just looking at lower 90s out in the deserts. And going further up north, head up to Alaska and Canada, a major weather system moving through that area. Very cool conditions continuing. A little wedge of warm air bringing temperatures up to the 60s, and then you go further to the east, temperatures are close to 80 degrees. 77 at the sour near Yellowknife, but up to the north, we do find the cool air in place with 32 in northern Victoria Island. Out in eastern Canada, not much going on. Little outgoing polar system, and that's bringing around some warm flow. You can see temperatures are quite warm there along the Hudson Bay region, 86. I think that's going to be around Fort Severn. And on the other side of the bay, near 80 degrees once again. Here's a look at high temperatures yesterday across the country. There will be a few errors here and there, like that 102 at Missouri. Don't worry about that. However, we do see 100s from East Texas all the way up to Oklahoma all the way down to the southwest through the DFW area and down to Austin. Now, of course, that has shifted south as that front has pushed down to the DFW area, the I-20 corridor, so those highs will be lower today. Elsewhere around the country, 110 at Palm Springs and 110 up there at Redding. California, just not really getting a break. Also 100 at Salt Lake City yesterday and hundreds in the high deserts of Nevada and 100s up in the Columbia River Basin. Let's take a look a little bit further north. That's how it stacked up around Canada. 80s all the way to the Northwest Territories, Nunavut. But further north, conditions are a little bit more typical of what we see this time of year. 36 up there at Grease Fjord, 39 at Resolute and 50 at Cambridge Bay. Or is that Cambridge Bay? Well, one of the two, 50 to 52. And Alaska, as you can see, quite cool. Looks like 70 degrees there at Fairbanks, one of the warmer areas, and the rest of the state, 50s for the most part. That would be really nice right about now. And let's go ahead and get a sneak peek at the forecast. These are the records Obviously, the hot weather concentrated on the West Coast. 105 expected today at Medford, 103 at Boise, and even out there at Quileute, looking at 83, looking to break that record set about 45 years ago. For tomorrow, more heat, again up there in the northwestern U.S., 104 at Omac and 105 at Pasco, and yeah, that deserves mention. 92 at Seattle, and not too many people up there have air conditioning, so that's going to be kind of rough. For Friday, we're going to be taking the edge off that heat just a little bit, but still 100 at Yakima. For Saturday, pretty typical August weather, a little bit hot out there in the San Joaquin Valley, and in Connecticut, looking at 90 degrees out there around Hartford. 
No real problems on Sunday. A little bit of heat there in the Great Basin. Looking good for Monday. And on Tuesday, no problems either. I remember back on Monday, we were looking at the potential for some heat here around the weekend, but I think the models are going a little bit less severe with that prospect. Looking at thunderstorm potential, yeah, they will be numerous, but not really much beyond severe limits. Numerous thunderstorms in the northeastern U.S. from Maine down towards Pennsylvania, where we have destabilization due to cold air advection. You've got cold air in the mid and upper levels, warming of that air mass from below, and you get those steep lapse rates. Down south, we've got that stagnant front all the way from the Carolinas to Texas and Oklahoma producing some storms, and further out west, there's that monsoon. At this hour, you can certainly see about where that front is, out through the Shreveport area to Longview, south of Dallas, and out towards Midland, Odessa, and more out west in West Texas, and that's where we pick up the summer monsoon. The sea breeze not really making much headway, straggling there along the Gulf Coast, not coming inland very much beyond about 30 miles. The satellite in the southwestern U.S. does show most of the showers confined to the higher elevations from east of Las Vegas down to Prescott and down to Safford. The deserts are looking pretty good at this hour, although they could use the rain for sure. And it's been slim pickings in California, not getting much in the way of monsoon activity. However, along the Sierra Madres, yeah, we do have thunderstorms going up through that area. And out there in Nevada, thunderstorms on the high deserts scattered at this time. Those are, of course, going to be high-based. Let's see, uh, Tonopah, where I used to work. Can't really pick that out very well. I think it's going to be right in there. And Area 51, that shows up pretty well, located right there. So storms and showers in the vicinity, but mostly up to the north. And some thunderstorm activity in the high plains near the Black Hills. That's a pretty good anvil right there. I guess that's going to be around Spearfish and some other anvils further southwest near Gillette. Moving to the northeast, quite a bit of cloud and dynamic weather activity. The main low has moved off to the east, but it has slung moisture to the northwest and to the west. So not quite dried out in that region just yet. And on the back side, we're getting that destabilization behind the front with numerous storms and showers wherever we get the solar heating. The Great Lakes getting some of that as well. You can see the cooling influence of the Great Lakes producing that absence of cloud material there. And where it comes onshore, it has not quite developed any convective clouds, but after a while, they do start forming, and that's what we have right there. Here's a sector we don't see very often, Ontario, Hudson Bay, and Manitoba. Thunderstorms developing through that region. There's no roads up there, so there's not going to be any storm chasing, but temperatures out ahead of these storms are in the mid-80s, as we saw earlier. And there's a quick look at the southeastern U.S. Don't really know how many viewers we have in that region, but plenty of storms out around Gulfport, Mobile, and the Seabreeze right there from Pensacola to Gainesville, producing numerous storms as well. There are some showers back behind in this region, but the air mass has dried out a little bit and is not quite as unstable as along the coast. And things continuing to look quiet in the tropics. The five-day outlook, a little potential there south of South Texas, Brownsville down to Veracruz, Tampico. So we'll keep an eye on that, but you can see just 30% chance expected in the next five days. All right, so let's go ahead and break down the forecast. Not a really exciting weather picture, but we'll check it out nonetheless. Now, you might look at this map and just focus on the highs and lows, but it's a good idea to look past that and look at the patterns you're seeing. For example, 
this is obviously a ridge. Let me give you the highs and lows. There's a high right there, there's a high right there. That's all significant, and that forms that ridge right there. So that's a push of cold air coming south into the Red River region and westward into the high plains. And that outlines a front, maybe becoming stationary. So it would look kind of like that. And the other end, let's see, that would connect back near that low. And there's another low that's not being picked up by the plotting algorithm. And these highs do connect back up into this other high. So this is all part of a big, happy ridge. The Great Lakes, not much going on there. And then further up to the northwest, you can see another front coming south. And we did pick that up on our surface analysis. Very likely a low right there. So now it starts to make a little bit more sense. And further out west, let's see, 1004 in the deserts. Uh, that's going to be a low right there. And that will differ a little bit from the surface analysis because there's different ways to compute sea level pressure. And especially over mountainous terrain, you're going to get some differing results. So when we compare it to a chart like this, it will look a little bit different. So we don't have to worry about that too much. So bearing that in mind, remember your polar front locations looking about like that. And we can roll that forward and see what happens. So let's go into tomorrow, into Thursday. That's going to be tomorrow evening. And it looks like a little boundary is pushed south through Texas and producing some vigorous storm activity. That other frontal wave in Montana looks like that's dipped south. So that's going to be the approximate location. And you can see the thickness lines in red outlining the thickness gradient just to the north and to the northeast. So that all looks about like what we would expect. Let's go forward into Friday. Just minor changes and looks like that frontal wave is still showing up in the very same area producing some of the storm activity in Iowa and Kansas. Further down to the south that boundary has probably started to wash out and the return flow already picking up in the western gulf. Going into, let's see, I'm all, all over the place here. Uh, get that recentered. Going to Saturday evening. And what do we have here? Well, there's something going on right there that could be a little meso high. I'm not sure. But we do have the strong onshore flow in the Texas Gulf Coast, a little inverted trough there. And further up to the north, some high pressure coming in from Canada. So that's probably going to bring some cool air southward. And going into Sunday, this is going to be Sunday evening right there. Looks like a little frontal boundary through here that outlines a trough. So that's probably the remnants of a weak front coming south. Another boundary probably right there. I've kind of lost track which one is which, but there they are for Sunday. Let's go into Monday. And let's see, so we're looking for the troughs. Let's see, 10, 14, 10, 12. So this is all high pressure. There's a tiny little low right there, but most of this is high pressure. And the trough is going to be right in there. So that's an old dissipating boundary, and probably one more right there. And see that trough right there, inverted trough, coming from Del Rio to Houston, that'll be significant. So that's probably the remnants of another frontal boundary. So that's how you can go about finding these things. And here comes another front out of Canada. That one looks like a new, fresh reinforcement of cool air. And I'll just take it forward. These boundaries come south, and they're not going to be forecast well this far out, 200 hours. So we kind of revert back to the synoptic scale patterns. And it does look stagnant. Little tropical activity down there in the Gulf around the 28th or 29th. That'll certainly not, don't worry about this. We're not looking at a hurricane in Mobile, but this will bear watching. It looks like the Gulf may be active towards the closing days of August. And this is good news. Well, this could be the GFS cold bias, but at 280 hours out, that's a huge outbreak of cool air coming south. 
I'm going to file this in the wishful thinking category, but there it goes. Cold air all the way down to Texas and Tennessee and Ohio, Pennsylvania. We'll keep an eye on that, but 540 line down to the Great Lakes. I don't know. That's a little bit extreme. We'll just check back in on that next week. I seriously doubt. I think that's going to be the cold bias that rearing its head towards the end of the run. And one other thing to show you, the remnants of that tropical depression or tropical disturbance that was down in Texas a couple days ago, that's drifted northwest. Currently, it's around the El Paso area. And watch this area of disturbed weather as we go into Thursday and Friday. You can see that moving just south of Arizona towards Friday and near the northern Gulf of Mexico around Saturday, and another little lobe up there around Lordsburg, New Mexico. That will be significant because that will help tap some of that precipitable water that's over the southwestern Arizona deserts. Here's the precipitable water anomaly showing the available tropospheric moisture. That's that slug of moisture coming up from Texas, the disturbance, and here's the monsoon moisture that's already in place. So if we go forward into Thursday and Friday, you can kind of see them interacting a little bit. Some popcorn type textures of the fields indicating deep convection. You can see things coming together and gelling down there in southern Arizona. So Phoenix, Tucson could be getting some significant precip in the next few days. And you can see the excessive rainfall forecast from WPC. There's the day one day two, and day three, a rare, moderate risk of excessive rainfall. And as far as precip totals over the next few days, probably the best model to look at is the GFS, and we'll just take that forward through the weekend. You can see how that stacks up. Looks like a lot of areas will be getting about one to two inches, some localized four to five inches, mostly around Tucson. So this could be a significant event for some of those areas. Some of the rain extending all the way to the Colorado River, and then you can see it drops off. California just not really getting much of this, but from Phoenix, Gila Bend, and Kingman back into New Mexico, lots of rain, and there will certainly be some localized flash flooding. And there's going into next week. Yeah, some of it does make it into California. That's good news for some of our viewers out there, but that's gonna be about a week from now. We'll just have to see what happens. And that will be our stopping point for today. A little bit of footage here from Castorville, Texas, thanks to Greg. And keep in mind, we do need your support to keep this program going. Every little bit helps and keeps me focused on the videos instead of other projects. And like I've said in the past, it is a balancing act. There's only so many hours in the day. So your support of the program is definitely essential. So bear that in mind. and. Here's our Patreon if you want to help out. And continuing to work on digital atmosphere, this is a rewrite that will work under Linux, Mac OS, and other operating systems. So this is one of the other things that's occupying my time. And of course, there are book projects on the back burner, just kind of a whole mess of different things. Hopefully, we'll start getting these out soon. And I think that'll about do it for today. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you back here on Friday for another edition of Forecast Lab. Take care. Bye-bye.